Take your Bible, if you would, please, and let's go to Revelation and chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 this morning. We've just come through the first two sections of the book. It has given us a divine outline in verse 19 of chapter 1. John is instructed to write the things which he had seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And so when you see those first two, the things which you've seen and the things which are, you see them as chapter 1 being the things which he had seen, the glorified Christ, the things which are, references the church age, and it's set before us in a panoramic view in chapters 2 and 3. So now what we're doing is we're turning to the things which shall be hereafter. And those words, hereafter, are Greek words, metatata. Now, you've learned some Greek. Say it with me real quick. Wait, this is for fun. Metatata. All right? Now you, now you say you learned some Greek. All right? And really, what is interesting about those words, the things which shall be hereafter, metatata, is that chapter 4 opens up with the words... Meta tata <laughs> says it twice in verse one. After this are the Greek words meta tata. Meta tata, I looked. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which uh, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, "Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be meta tata hereafter." As if we needed it emphasized, needed it amplified, needed it drilled into, God puts it very clearly for us, here's your third section. You have a divine outline for the book, and therefore you can take it to heart. God has thought of everything. Now many of us know that there was a prophetic um, uh, pronouncement on the uh, internet recently saying that yesterday would be the day when the rapture would occur according to some things about Revelation 12 and how that lining up of the stars and different constellations and so forth. Uh, most of us understood if the Lord did come this past week, it would have been perhaps on Thursday to Friday, which was Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets. Uh, I just want to say he didn't come because I'm still here and I know he's coming for me. So praise God. You know, I know he's coming for me. Now, what we do look for is we look for chapter 4, verse 1, to occur in real time. And what we have before us is a chapter that really could be coupled with chapter 5 as well. Uh, 4 and 5 really bring us into the throne room of God. You know, there is a throne room of God. And he's not worried. He's not wringing his hands. Things are not out of control. And he's not wondering, what, oh, what shall we do? <laughs> he's in control. The fact is, is that when we go through these two chapters, what we will find is that, in essence, all of heaven is brought up close and personal to receive what we might call a consensus for the pulling of the trigger uh, to the entering in of the great tribulation that is before us in these chapters. In other words, God pulls the groups. Everyone in heaven, everyone in earth, and under the earth and all that. We've got the angels, we've got the beasts, we've got the, uh, the, the living creatures, we would call them. Uh, we've got all of these people brought in up close and personal, and all of them say, you're worthy. Take to yourself honor and glory and power and all those things, because the consensus is not just a consensus as if God is asking for permission. It's a consensus uh, that comes as a result of God's, listen, reluctance. God doesn't want to pull this trigger. God does not want to pull the trigger on wrath. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Something we need to remember. And so as we come to this chapter, we're going to take these chapters uh, one at a time because one of them emphasizes one aspect of God uh, and His majesty and His power, and the other uh, amplifies the other aspect of His majesty and His power. So we're going to look at chapter 4 together today. Uh, there was a girl, or a lady actually, she was a lady who had uh, many years on her, and she had a uh, heart attack. And when she had her heart attack, she literally flatlined for about six minutes. While she was flatlining, she realized she was in some kind of a weird place. And she looked around and she saw her guardian angel. 
And when she saw her guardian angel, she says, am I going to die now? The guardian angel said, no, you're not going to die now. You're going to have 30 more years. 30 more years. And about that time, bam, they bring her back and she's there back in her body and everything's good. And subsequently, as she's recovering, she makes up her mind, wow, 30 years, I'll tell you what, while we're here, why don't we get some work done? <laughs> she got a facelift, she got some liposuction, she got a tummy tuck, and she was looking good. She says, you know, if I'm going to be here 30 years, may as well look my best. She leaves the hospital after all this surgery that she had, and she was hit by a bus. And subsequently, she's standing there before her guardian angel and said, I thought you said I had 30 years. She said, he said, yeah, you did, but I didn't recognize you. <laughs> so, uh, I did not recognize you. So, you and I, you know, sometimes we don't recognize the church, I guess is where I'm going with that. Uh, the church has had a lot of changes, as we saw in chapters 2 and 3. And as a result of that, the church is almost unrecognizable from what it was in the first century, isn't it? And so as we come to this time, we realize that even when these, this door opens and a voice is heard, and it has this sound of a trumpet talking with John, saying, come up hither. The fact is, is one of the things Jesus reminded us is that in the last days, when the Son of Man shall come, he said, will he even find the faith on the earth? Not faith. Everybody has faith. The lost man has faith. When he goes to a restaurant and eats the food placed before him coming out of a kitchen, uh, be, 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 having been prepared by somebody that he does not know, he is walking by faith. When he goes through a green light, as anticipating everybody else has got a clue, the red light means stop, he is walking by faith. Everybody walks by faith. But Jesus said, when he comes, will he even find the faith on the earth? And what we saw in our study of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 is that the faith morphed. It changed. It bumped here and there. It was bounced around, almost unrecognizable at times, and ultimately to end in a time of apostasy. It is in 2 Thessalonians that we are told that apostasy must come first. There must be a falling away first before the man of sin would be revealed. Uh, and that the that, the, that he that hinders or restrains or letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then the man of sin could be revealed. We are living in some pretty strange times. Tsunamis and earthquakes. We have a, 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 a what we would call a super volcano in Yellowstone that is bulging as uh, St. Helens, uh, Saint, uh, Mount St. Helens uh, bulged back in the 80s. Uh, we have a lot of things going on and people everywhere are wondering what is going to happen. Well, we are told what is going to happen. We just don't know where or when it's going to happen. We just know that God sits in the heavens and He knows exactly what's going on. And He knows what must needs be done about it. Jesus, in talking about the days in which you live, and I, you and I live, uh, he, he said this. He says, it will be as in the days of Noah, and it will be as in the days of Lot. You remember that? Both of those two were categorized as being little heads-ups of what's coming. And the days of Noah was a time of violence. The Bible says violence filled the land. you remember that? And so God said He's going to not bear with man and wrestle with man, or uh, He will not always strive with man. And He says He's got 120 years. And in that time, Noah built an ark, and God brought the rain, and He wiped out the whole generation, and here we are today. What about the days of Lot? Well, in the days of Lot, what you had was uh, a time of great depravity. The issues of sodomy. We know what it means. There were two men who were angels, actually, who came into Lot's home. The men of the, of the city came and pounded on the doors and said, Send those men out here that we may know them. And Lot, having been corrupted in his own morals. He didn't have a law, by the way. There was no law saying, thou shalt not. Everybody was kind of fending for themselves. Moses had not been born yet. The law had not been given. But they knew right from wrong in their consciences. But Lot says, take my daughters. Don't do this to these men. About the time he's ready to put his daughters out in the, in the bad place, the angels pulled them back and smote them with blindness. But what is powerful is it says the young... And the old groped all night long to get to that door. The blindness didn't even stop them. We've had uh, hurricanes in uh, Texas. We've had hurricanes that have affected Texas. Hurricanes that have affected uh, the, the, the state of Florida. 
And you know and I know that when you saw the pictures of what happened in Florida, it looked like it should have been terrible devastation and loss of life. Only a handful of people lost their lives, and tragically so. But God has given us wake-up calls on every front. We are on the cusp of something amazing. The Bible says that you and I are not in the darkness, that the day of the Lord should overtake us as a thief in the night, but it will overtake them as a thief. Because they deny, deny, deny. And as it says about Lot's day, the young and the old groped for that door. And what we've got today is we've got young people being slimed by parents who are really AWOL, not telling their children about eternity, not preparing them for eternity. You may have heard about the young girl who had talked to her mother as she lay a dying. And she said, Mom, you've taught me how to dress. You've taught me how to be gracious. You've taught me how to, you know, win boys' hearts. You've taught me how to do life and make a living. But you've never, never taught me how to die. Mama, what am I going to do? And her mom had no answer because she cared to have no answer during her lifetime. When we come to these chapters, we are seeing God reluctantly uh, willing to pull the trigger on this thing called the tribulation. We see him ready to rear the curtain and let it begin. And so as John is pulled aside on the Isle of Patmos and he is given a vision of the risen Christ, as he's been told what's going to happen in the church age, he is now being shown what will happen in the great tribulation, at the time of the tribulation and the great tribulation. Verse 1 says, After this, metatata, the things which shall be hereafter. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, there are people who believe that there is no heaven. They're called Jehovah's Witnesses. Right here it says, There was a door opened in heaven. So right away we understand, Let God be true, and every man a liar. God is in heaven. People are in heaven. Angels are in heaven. And I'm going to heaven, praise God. Amen? That's where I want to be. And the Bible says that he saw a door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet. I don't think that it is without significance that it says it sounded like a trumpet. Because the Bible says that a trumpet's going to sound, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together in the air to meet them, and so shall we ever be with them and in in, be with the Lord. Isn't that cool? I mean, what a narrative your story has and my story has. It is incredible to think. But I have often said that extreme times demand extreme measures. Who would have thunk you could have picked up a piece of glass and talked to somebody on the other side of the nation in real time? Who would have thunk you could have talked to somebody on the other side of the earth? Who would have thought you could have got out into the, into the atmosphere and looked down and seen the earth? Who would have thought that you and I would be able to drive around in a self-propelled vehicle or fly through the air in a, in a contraption that weighs tons? You and I are living in some extreme times, and extreme measures, therefore, are demanded. When God drew, poured out wrath and, and fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah, the book of Jude tells us that he did this as an example of damnation and judgment. God says, this is what that is going to look like. So he did it's an extreme thing. He did it once. Was there ever a city overrun so much by sodomy and the deprivations thereof? I'm sure there have been. And America's on its way. We know that we have a lot of explaining to do. But it says a trumpet. This voice sounded like the voice of a trumpet. And the voice said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be metatata, hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now understand, as you look at that, there's a couple of things we need to look at closer. He says, immediately I was in the Spirit. Now this reminds us of something else. It's important that when you read the book of Revelation especially, you try to find little touchstones in the rest of the Bible. For instance, when the Bible says a great door was opened in uh, Philadelphia to the Philadelphia 
Philadelphian church. Uh, it, we remember Paul said, a great door was opened unto me, and I was worried about Titus, and I went, he knew it was, we know, therefore, it was an opportunity to witness. The Philadelphia, Philadelphian part of the church age was a time of great witness. Uh, when it talks about Sardis, it says, if you don't repent, he says, be careful and be watchful, lest uh, he com- I come upon you as a thief. And we understand that the thief uh, analogy or touchstone would be found in Cor- uh, in Second Th- or First Thessalonians chapter five that the world uh, that the that the Lord Jesus would come upon the world as a thief in the night, and we understand what he's saying. He tells the Thyatira church that they're going to go into great tribulation. If we read chapters 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew, we find that there's tribulation and there will be great tribulation in those days. And he's telling them that they're going to experience some really, really bad stuff. So you get these touchstones throughout and you begin to put them together and it helps you and it helps me. Verse 2 says, I was in the Spirit. And what I would suggest to you is that you would put in your margin there Ezekiel chapter 1. The Bible talks about, actually, Ezekiel chapter 8. The Bible talks about Ezekiel being caught up in the Spirit and carried to Jerusalem. Uh, He was by the brook Chabar. He was there minding his own business, having his prophetic ministry, standing against the the, uh, naysayers who said Jerusalem could never fall. And God makes him a picture, a parable of behaviors that he has to go through. While he's there, God takes him to uh, to Jerusalem and he shows Ezekiel, why it is he's going to remove his Shekinah glory and allow this particular city to be destroyed. He was caught up. He was carried away in the Spirit. Such is the case here. And what you're going to see is there's a couple of con- uh, connections with Ezekiel, but the one that is first in, our, uh, in the crosshairs of our thought is the fact that he was told, come up hither, and he says, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Another thing to get uh, from this is that it says, come up hither. And immediately I was in the Spirit. This is emblematic, very deliberately emblematic, of the church being raptured. (laughs) Because he's going to say to you and me, come up hither, and we're going to be immediately in the Spirit. The Bible says that this mortal is going to put on immortality, that this corruptible is going to put on corrupt, incorruption, and death is going to be swallowed up in, of life. Uh, the Bible also tells us in chapter 4, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the, lot, of the Lord will be caught up into the heavens, and will be ever with the, so shall we ever be with the Lord. You and I are going to be caught up in the Spirit. It is not something that is unheard of. In fact, God has given us picture after picture after picture of what it means to be caught up in the Spirit. Ezekiel is the one I've just referenced. He gets caught up in the Spirit in chapter 8 of his book. But remember, Enoch, in the book of Genesis, the Bible says, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for the Lord took him. What an amazing thing. I've often said, I want to be a was not, you know. Sure beats being a has been, I'll tell you. I want to be a was not. And the fact is, is that Enoch was not, for the Lord took him. And he had this testimony that he pleased the Lord. We also see the pictures in in, in Noah's experience. We see Noah being told in 120 years, you know, I'm going to, bring rain, and he didn't maybe know that part of the narrative. He just knew he needed to build this ark God had in mind, and subsequently, when the time came, God put him in the ark, and he put him in place of safety, and then he rained down wrath on the earth. A picture of what it is to have been um, into, uh, brought into a place of being caught away from the devastations that were to come. Uh, in fact, as I recall, it was, uh, he was told to go into the ark, and he was in the ark seven days. And then it began to rain. Remember that. Seven days. A picture of how long we're going to be in glory. Seven years. As I see the scriptures unfolding, I believe that to be the case. I know there are going to be seven years at least, but some would take issue with that. And I'm not going to depart fellowship on anybody who, who wants to disagree with me. They can apologize later. And subsequently, uh, what we have is we have being caught up. We have Lot. We have Lot, who is in his uh, terrible place, this city called Sodom, and uh, the its sister city, Gomorrah. He's, he's there. He's a ruler in the city. He even got in the, in, the, in the gates where he's actually executing some judgments in the city, and he's making impact there. Subsequently, uh, when the time came for judgment, the angels came and took him by the hand and literally drug him out of the city because he tarried. 
And they drug him out, and then the fire fell. And subsequently, we have a picture of the rapture. We see Elijah being taken up physically, bodily, in a chariot of fire. We see Jesus being raptured when we see him at the, at the uh, day of ascension in, in Acts chapter 1. We see Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. And once they came up out of, the, out of the water, he was caught away. Rapture, rapture, rapture. Jesus is coming for you and for me. Now, why would he do that? Because he's merciful. Because he wants to take us away from this wrath that has to come. But he also cares about those that will be left behind. Everything that will take place from chapter 4 to chapter 19 is, a, is an invitational for people to get saved. It is an altar call. God's saying, listen, I'm doing something extreme on the canvas of human time. I know you think you know it all, he will be saying to that generation. But you have not seen anything anything yet. Chapter 6, they're going to say out loud what they know internally. Rocks and hills fall on us. They will cry out to the rocks and hills, fall on us. It says, for the day of the wrath of the Lamb has come. They know, but they have denied, denied, denied. It is an altar call. But the Bible says there's a trumpet here. The Bible says there's a call here. Come up hither. Uh, there's a there's a, we're in the Spirit. We see John in the Spirit here. And all of this is understood to deal with the rapture. Another thing to think about in regard to this is the fact that this word caught up. Uh, I was immediately caught up. Um, uh, he, it was immediately in the Spirit. It answers to where it says caught up over in First Thessalonians. People say, well, the rapture. The word rapture does not appear in the Bible anywhere. Well, it doesn't appear in the English Bible. But it does appear in the Latin Vulgate. Uh, the word is rapir, and it has the idea of to be caught up or to catch away. So the word rapture comes from a Greek uh, or from a, a, a verb in the Latin, rapio, which means to catch up. So the word rapture is in the Bible. Uh, and also understand this, that when he gives us this word, uh, you, and people make that argument, there's also that problem they have with the word Trinity. It's nowhere in the Bible. But the Bible does say, baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's a triune God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father, right? I and my Father are one. And we're going to see in this passage in front of us here also that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all connected to this throne that is in the heavens. So I suggest to you that rapture is in the Bible. It's just translated, caught up from the Greek word harpia, uh, harpazo, and the Latin uses the word rapio or rapimir, rapimir, if I'm saying that properly. And so we have it in there. Now, the perspectives we have in this chapter have to do with a throne. It is the center of the universe, if you will. God's throne. The word throne shows up over and over again in the next two chapters. This is, in fact, the throne room of God. Verse 2 says, I was in the Spirit, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Uh, if you were to make a connection, uh, you could connect this to e Ezekiel chapter one. I mentioned Ezekiel chapter 8 being in the Spirit. You can use that for verse 2. But verse 3 where he says, uh, uh, Behold a throne. If you go in your margin and put the, the reference Ezekiel chapter 1, you would find that Ezekiel also sees this throne. <clears throat> He's by the brook Chabar or the river Chabar and subsequently he sees some kind of a whirlwind out over the desert coming his way. And he begins to get it begins to get closer, and he begins to notice some wheels within the wheels. And we get all caught up in the wheels and stuff. You know, it's kind of cool. We don't really understand how to parse all that, but what we do see is that they're still there. <laughs> when we come to this chapter, those wheels are still there, those faces are still there, those living creatures are still there. But really, all those are just details. The most important thing is the throne and the throne sitter. And so he says, "Behold, a throne." Now, when Ezekiel sees it in Ezekiel 1, he sees it from the bottom. And so he actually sees wheels and creatures, and he sees a canopy, calls it a firmament. And then he goes up over the firmament and comes down, and he sees one like under the Son of Man. He sees fiery man in the midst of man, like blazing like fire, like under the Son of Man. All these really amazing things that we see first. 
So where he sees it from the bottom looking up and is brought up over the top by the Spirit, uh, John sees from the side and from above. He says, I saw a throne. Behold, a throne uh, was set in heaven and one sat on it, or sat on the throne. And he was, and he that sat was to look upon as jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, this is all we get about the, uh, the first development that he takes note of, on the throne. He says, on the throne I see one sitting. He looks uh, like, uh, the, like the Son of Man, if you will. He says, he, one sat upon it. He said he was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone and a rainbow round about. Now... This, the, this has so much just in this little bit. Uh, George, can you turn the AC on? I see people waving. I'm getting extra warm. Both of you, both sides have to be hit. And uh, if you guys would do that, thank you. But this particular section is very instructive for us. Because where you look in Ezekiel seeing a throne sitter, he sees a lot of what Jesus or what Ezekiel had seen, where he sees, uh, Ezekiel sees what John had seen, uh, where when he saw him, his eyes like fire, and there's this, this, this outshining and all of that. But what we have now is we have something else that's very prominent. Verse 3, it says that he, that he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about like an emerald. Now, if we don't know the rest of the Bible, that's just details. But when we know the rest of the Bible, we can begin to see something very profound here. Uh, you see, when it says in verse 3, uh, he was like a jasper, uh, jasper was one of the stones on the breastplate of the high priest. You see, when Moses was given the pattern of the tabernacle and the priestly garments, uh, the high priest was supposed to have a special a thing called an ephod, which held a, a breastplate on his front. And there were 12 stones on, those, on that breastplate. The first uh, stone uh, was a stone that had the name engraved upon it, Reuben. And the last stone was, had, on it, had engraved upon it the youngest son, Benjamin. Those are the colors of the stones that represent these two sons. And when Reuben was born... Uh, the, he was named Reuben because Reuben's name means, Behold, a son. <laughs> now, John is coming into this presence of this throne sitter, and the first thing he sees is, Behold, a son. <laughs> now, Benjamin's name, because Joseph was lost by uh, going being sold into Egypt and so forth, so Benjamin is brought into play because Benjamin is the son of his old age, and it says, and his name literally means uh, means son of my right hand. <laughs> okay, so you got behold a son, the son of my right hand. And if you put those things in here, you have a throne sitter, and the only thing that's seen is not his his visage, but the colors that say behold a son, the son of my right hand. That's powerful. He's seeing Jesus sitting on the throne. And the Bible tells us that he uh, sees these colors, but he also sees something else. He sees a rainbow. And this is not a partial bow. Verse 3 says he saw a rainbow round about the throne. It was literally a completed bow. You know, last year, I think it was, was it 2016, they passed a Burgafell, or was it 15? This goes so quick. Uh, when they passed a Burgafell, uh, they lit our, our capital, or our, the White House, up in rainbow colors. And ever since then, people are running around pointing to the rainbow as if they somehow have the right to commandeer the covenantal sign that God gave saying, I will, know, I will never again destroy the earth by water. Every time you see a rainbow in the sky you are reminded God once destroyed it by water and he'll never do it again, but he will destroy it by fire. <laughs> so we have a covenant that's never going to be destroyed by water, but we also have a, uh, a, a, just God's word that he's going to destroy it by fire one day. But the thing about this rainbow is it's a complete rainbow, which basically is saying that God has been 
has given us a promise. That's what we're reminded of. God gave us a promise he wouldn't destroy the earth by water. But it's also a symbol, because it's complete, of completion. God has come to the full term of completion. He represents promise and completion. We can derive that from this rainbow. And the Bible says that there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And if you were to take the word for emerald and go back to the high priest's breastplate, the emerald was the stone of Judah. Connection, Jesus, again, came from Judah. He's the king, apparent. And his name means praise. Behold a son, the son of my right hand. Praise be. What we have is we have a throne sitter. And he's not worried. He's in complete control. And though you and I may feel like sometimes things are falling apart, I believe they're falling in place. Jesus is coming. And the throne sitter is right where he's supposed to be, seated in the throne, waiting for the day when his enemies will be made his footstool. Uh, the Bible then turns the corner and says, not only did he, he talked about on the throne in verse 2, but in verse 4 it says, and round about the throne. You might underline that. Round about, on the throne. On the throne, round about the throne. Now we're looking at round about the throne. So John has kind of shaken himself from this amazing uh, visage, visage that he's seen. But he turns now and he sees what's round about the throne. It says, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And then it says, and out of the throne, and that'll be the next section. But verse 4 is very powerful. You see, on the throne, or, or uh, before, around the throne, we see uh, 24 seats. And there's a lot of discussion that's been had about what these represent. It says there's 24 seats and there's 24 elders. Now, when you look at that, the thing to remember is that, chapter, is that in chapter 3, it concluded with Jesus saying that, you know, there's going to be an apostasy that the church is going to be a mess, uh, that he's going to look for people in verse 21 that will overcome in that last day of apostasy, and he will grant them to sit with me in my throne. These 24 seats are around the throne, as it were, 24 thrones. 24. So only 24 people are getting saved. Just say it. No, no, it's not what it's saying. 24. We connect that to the Old Testament as well. When David was organizing the temple worship of his day, or the tabernacle at that time, 1 Chronicles chapter 24 tells us that there were uh, 24 courses to the temple uh, system. In other words, you had all these priests that come from Levi, thousands no doubt, and only 24 places of service right up close and in the tabernacle. Now, you remember this because, though you may not have known it or perceived it before, you may remember that it was Zacharias who was married to Elizabeth, and he was serving the Lord in his course. He was a Levite. His job was to do something with the uh, incense or the candles. And Gabriel shows up and says, Elizabeth's going to have a son. Now, they're past the age of childbearing. And he says, how can this be? And he says, you're not going to, you're questioning me. We're here. We're on this ground. And you're questioning me. Because you did that, you're not going to talk until that baby is here. Okay? So he got a reprimand. But he was serving in his course. There were 24 courses uh, that David set up for the, ma uh, for the management and discharge of the responsibilities, daily responsibilities of that, uh, that, that administration. So what we see is 24. So it coincides with what happens uh, in the shadow of the tabernacle. Uh, we find that it actually finds full embodiment in the reality of God's uh, throne room. Now, who are the throne sitters? Well, there are a couple clues. I just gave you one in verse 21 of chapter 3. Uh, many would be uh, able to sit with me in my throne. Other things it says about these guys is it says, number one, that they are 24 elders. If you uh, realize that the word elder is 
related to leadership, you know, in the church, right? The elders, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, those kind of things. Eldership has to do with spiritual maturity and qualification. And everyone who is a child of God now uh, is completely deemed righteous, declared righteous. That's called justification. We've had the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, and when we get home, there will be no more sin nature. We'll be glorified. There will be no more mortal boy, b- bodies. There will be no more corruptible system uh, 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 natures. We're not going to have a sin nature. We're going to be glorified, changed, and we're going to have death swallowed up of life. Now, he says these are elders. So right there we see uh, the idea of, of their spiritual maturity. But if you want to see it in the church earlier, chapter 3 and verse 12 talks about the, uh, Philip, uh, the uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphian church. In verse 12 it says, In the Philadelphian church, him that overcometh, I will make a pillar. So everybody who gets through having overcome becomes a pillar. Where do we see the word pillar? We see it over in Galatians in chapter 2 where Paul is dressing down Peter uh, because when James and John and Peter were all there, Peter uh, had full stepped. He had misstepped. When uh, James sent an entourage from, uh, from, from Jerusalem to this area of Galatia, uh, Peter withdrew from the Gentiles. He was embarrassed to be eating with them. And Paul calls them pillars, James and Peter and John. They're pillars. But now we're being told that everyone who overcomes is going to be made a pillar. So we see pillars, elders. These are people who are qualified specially. Another thing we see is that they're clothed in white raiment. If you were to look at the white raiment in the church, you'd see that in chapter 3 and verse 18. I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and uh, white and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. So these guys have white raiment. So they have white raiment. They're called pillars or elders, and they're sitting where the Bible promised in verse 21 of chapter 3, we'd be able to sit, and it says, and on their heads were crowns of gold. Crowns of gold. The word crown here is the Greek word stephanos. There are two words for crown. One is stephanos, the other is diadem. A diadem is a crown by right, by birth, kind of the crown of a king, and nobility. A stephanos is the victor's crown. And it says there's, they're going to have victor's crowns of gold. We also see that crown in chapter 2 and verse 10, where the Bible tells us that they are to let no man uh, steal their crown. In Smyrna, let no man uh, take your crown. So we got a lot of pictures of who these guys are. It says these guys not only have those things, uh, but the Bible says of these people who are sitting there, uh, if you were to jump over to chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, And when he, Jesus, had taken the book, the four beasts and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, and, uh, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book. Why? Because you were slain and you have redeemed us. Who are they, these elders? They are the redeemed. You see, the church does not appear from chapter 3 to chapter 19, or actually 21, I believe it is, and it's not really even mentioned as a church as much. Chapter 22, some would put it at, because it says the bride and the church do the church and the bride say come. Uh, But we, we see it like 19 times in these first couple of chapters, but then we don't hear of them anymore. Why? Because they're... I'm up hither. They're up hither. And they're up hither and they're seated. And they're in courses. Now, the beautiful thing about these guys is, is that they got 24 courses, which means there's a whole bunch of saints. It says in chapter 5 that they, he redeemed us from every tribe, nation, tongue, and people, and all that. There's more than 24. But every one of us gets to be up front personal with Jesus one day in our courses throughout eternity. Every now and then you're going to go in, be all struck again, just drinking in, and then subsequently throwing your crown down, walk, staggering out the door, and finding your crown put right back on your head because he loves you that much. It's going to be a good day. These are the church in heaven. These represent the church in heaven. And the Bible says that they uh, that these elders were there, they had crowns on their head. Verse 5 says, and out of the throne. So we've seen on the throne. We've seen around the throne. And now we're seeing out of the throne in this same uh, picture. 
It says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So where are they? Where is the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit? He's on the throne. So out of the throne, we're hearing this. This is, reminds us of uh, the book of Exodus when the law was given in chapter 19 and verse 16. The loudness of, their, uh, of, the, of the trembling of the land and so forth was so much people were covering their ears. They were, just, they were awestruck at the foot of the mountain when the law was to be given. And there was earthquake, fire, and so forth. And what we see here is we see that same kind of picture uh, represented as the Holy Spirit is here. In verse 6, it says, and before the throne, which is much more made of this, so I would put an underline that as well. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four living creatures, we should say, because the word beasts is used later uh, as therion or therapon. I can't remember exactly which one, but this one is zuon. It's the word of living creatures. We get the word zoo from it. These are living creatures. These were full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third beast was like a, had the face of a man. And the fourth, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. What you have now is you have a remembrance of what Ezekiel saw in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. He saw these very same faces. These faces represent what I would call reflectors. Who are these living creatures? Well, we get a couple of pictures further in verse 8. It's a couple of uh, details further in verse 8. It says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Now, we remember that, maybe. Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His glory of His train filled the temple, and there were seraphim in His presence. And it says, With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. Seraphim is distinguished from cherubim. Both are angels, but seraphim means burning ones. And these, we don't know how many there were in Isaiah, but here we're told there are four. And these are the ones that are right up close to the throne of God. And if you remember when Moses saw the goodness of God pass before him, his face shone. If you remember when Adam and Eve sinned, the glory of God evidently left them and they knew they were naked. Prior to that, they had this glory glow about them, it seems. And Moses had the glory, and they said, cover your face, we can't take how bright your face is shining. Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, pulls back the veil of his flesh, and he's shone like the sun, you recall. So these, these living creatures become what I would say uh, speak to the heart as being reflectors. Why? Because of the things that, they, that, that when you look at them up close from the outside and from beside them, you see. Uh, Ezekiel saw these very same things. The first beast was like a lion which is the king of all beasts. Jesus is king. We also see this in the four Gospels, a, a comparison with the four Gospels. Matthew's Gospel is about Jesus being king. It gives us, his, it gives us his, uh, um, his lineage back to King David. He has the right to the throne. He's the king. And all, about, and all Matthew is about amplifying Jesus as the king. He's the king, he's the king. And it says, And the second beast was like a calf. This reminds us of the book of Mark. The calf is the servant creature, right? It pulls the it's the it pulls the the plow. It, it serves the 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 the, the, uh, the man by by giving uh, milk and meat and 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 bread from the field. So he's like a servant. And the big word that you come over again and again to uh, you come across again and again in the book of Mark is the word straightway he went straightway he went straight he was constantly he was always going. He has no lineage in the book of Mark because a servant needs none. He is simply a servant. He is set before us as the servant. Then it says, and the third beast had the face of a man. Luke, Luke's gospel, he, so, he calls him over and again the son of man. Jesus calls himself in Luke's gospel the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. And here he is, he's, he's, he's got a face of a man. These guys, these, these angels, as it were, these seraphim are reflectors as it were, showing who he was because what? God changes not. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in the Old Testament it says, I am God and I change not. The fourth beast is like a flying eagle. John's Gospel says Jesus 
was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the, and the eagle represents, as it were, for us, for our purposes, uh, that he is God, which shows us that he is not only uh, seen as the eagle, but an eagle has the ability to be above everything, and he has the keen eyes to see everything. And John's Gospel shows us Jesus is God. And he comes closer in John's Gospel to declaring that personally, when he tells the uh, woman at the well, I that speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. And then you also see, of course, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh. And so we have the eagle represented here. Uh, and these four living creatures as well. And what do they do? Well, the Bible says they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night. So we know these guys are also related back to Isaiah 6, because it was there that, he, that Isaiah said he heard them saying, Holy, holy, holy. This, this refrain is going on over and over again from the time of Isaiah to the present uh, that John is standing in and to the present that you and I are sitting in today. They said, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Wow! But look what the defining of those words is in verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him. <laughs> I'm reading through this and I'm seeing Him say three words. Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And those words, the thrice holy God is set forth. And it would seem that there's a connection because it says, and those beasts would, were giving glory. Do you know, if my little granddaughter says, Grandpa, Grandpa, you're the best. You know, that, that means a lot to me. You all say, yeah, right. You know, he's not the best. I am. I don't know what you'd say, but, you know, when you have a little child telling us something, that's one thing. But when you have somebody, let's say, who is the top of their game, the person that was better than anybody, maybe the person who invented a certain discipline or a certain craft, and they come to you and they say, you nailed it. That's huge. These living creatures are saying holy. And when they say holy, that means a lot more than when I say holy. Because I'm still in the shadow lands. I don't completely appreciate what that means. But when they say holy, that's giving honor to the Lord Jesus. Holy. Holy. Set apart. Set above. Set over. And separate from all things. He is holy God. So they give glory to Him. They give honor to Him by saying it. And the Bible says that in this is also knit the idea of giving thanks to Him that sits upon the throne. The Bible says, and thanks to Him that sits upon the throne, who liveth forever and ever. When those beasts do this, the four and twenty elders fall down uh, before Him that sat on the throne. Fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him. Now, these four and twenty elders at this point are representative of the entire church. There are in their courses. The holy, holy, holy is going on constantly in this room. Uh, behold, uh, a son, uh, the son of my right hand, praise. All this is going on. A rainbow, promise, uh, a rainbow, complete, complete rainbow, completion. We see God faithful. We see him depicted. We see him seen. And we see these, these elders, these church people. They're just people. There's just, their name is Mildred, and, and, and there's Sam, and there's Joe, and there's Paul, and, and they're just guys. But now, they're glorified, and they're in the presence of Jesus, and they're, they're overwhelmed, and they fall on their faces. And they worship Him. And the word worship is a word that means to 
to just want to kiss, want to draw closer, get really close. Think of a, of a puppy. The Greek word is proskaneo. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, kiss the son in Psalm 2, lest he be angry with you. The idea of worship is knit in the word kiss. It's the word to want more of him. You just want more of him. Don't you just want more of him? Every now and then, don't you just say, I'm, see, I'm, I'm smelling some celestial air. I'm, I'm hearing some songs of Zion. I'm hearing that praise from the company of the saints of ages past. And I've come to Mount Zion. And every now and then, all the shadows dispel. And He is seen by our souls. And we want to worship Him more. Would to God it was more often. Amen? Amen? We, we need to want to worship Him more. The word kuneo, at the word of pros kuneo, means puppy dog. Think of a little, uh, a little boy in the midst of a you know, little litter of puppies, and they're all jumping up and licking his face, and you just laugh. They want to be like that. They want to just get around Him. But they can't. They just fall down. And they worship Him. They fall down. And they worship Him that liveth forever and ever. Do you know He's alive today? Do you know, he is he that was dead and yet lives. He told the Smyrnaean church, here we have him living forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. Why? Because they say, I didn't do anything. He did it all. <laughs> Thanks for letting me. You can have this back. And they want to just give back any crowns they've been motivated to go for. And the Bible says they do this, casting down their throne, uh, their, their crowns and, and falling on their faces and worshiping Him. And they're saying these words in verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are created, are and were created. Beloved, the emphasis of chapter 4 is upon Jesus, the throne sitter, who is the creator. If you see him in that light, it can boggle the mind. He is the one who ordained that the earth be hung upon nothing. He is the one who declared, let the stars be in the firmament. Let the moon have its course. Let the, the sun to rule the day, the, the moon to rule by night. Let the seasons come and let it continue, springtime and harvest. He's the one who declared it and it stood fast. And he holds it together. And this boggles the mind. Even as He's suffering on the cross, even as He is quivering flesh, ripped and torn by a cat of nine tails, naked and exposed, an apparent failure and blood running down, and a crown of thorns pressed in, and blood and sweat and tears, He's hanging on the cross. He still held it together. That's God! And He is on the throne and He is our King. And He has seen fit to bring us near. The Bible says in that passage that they declare you are worthy to take or to receive, I should say, because the Greek word is lambano and it means to take. But in verse 11 it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive. But the Greek word has the emphasis more upon take. It's almost like He's getting them, He's having us see that they are saying, take to yourself glory. There's three words for this. One means reluctance. Uh, one means to take. One means uh, to take it with violence. This is not violence. It's just, just receive it, Lord. Just take it. You know, it's like, just go ahead and take it. It's like maybe you gave your kid a gift one time and they, no, that's too much. And no, go ahead and take it. And it's like the, the, the uh, heavenly host in that room, especially uh, seen in those elders. You are worthy to take this. Why? Because you are the one who died for us. Here's our crowns. Take, take, take. And what's he going to take? Glory and honor and power during the tribulation. He's going to take it. In chapter 5, we're going to see him emphasizing not his creation and his creative work, 
in creation, but his redemptive work in redemption. We got a glimpse of that in a minute, uh, a minute ago when we were looking at it. Uh, let me show you one more thing. Turn over in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. Back a few pages. The Bible says in chapter 3 and verse 8, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, people like to take that and say, see, you could have thousands of years in the creation. No, 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 no. That's not what he's talking about here at all. Don't take a passage and apply it where it don't need to be. Because it does say in the Bible, the morning and the evening were the first day. As if to say, hush now, just pay attention. <laughs> it's okay, I got this. In fact, in Revelation 20, it says he's going to immediately, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's not going to use six days to do it, okay? So that's all. Let's put that off to the side. What this is saying is that a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. That means today in the eyes of God. Today. Your day will be parsed as if it took a thousand years to live. He's going to see every nuance of your thought, of your mind, of your heart, of your inclinations, of your propensities. He's going to see each one of us in complete, barren, completely bare before Him. Because one side is a thousand years, is as a day, but the other side is a day. It's like a thousand years to God. And you know what He sees? Because of eyes of grace, He sees there's something there. He sees all the nasty, but he's, there, there's something there. Maybe you found something in the world in which you lived where you were like, man, I'm out by the beach and some you know, sand moved around. You saw something. Man, it, look what I found. Do you know what Jesus is constantly doing? He's just reluctant to pull this trigger. Why? Because he sees there's something there. When I work with guys in Cleveland and I listen to their stories, I think there's something, there's something there. This past week, one of the guys came in, and we had eight or ten of us sitting there, and he says, oh, what about this verse? Out of the blue, he said, what about this verse? It says, look not every man on the things of himself, but also on the things of others. And I'm like, yikes, because I would never have done that in a group of eight guys, because I knew somebody, just one is all it takes. And about three of them pounced on the poor guy. And I had to jump in with him. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's a good verse. And it's a good passage. And it really does tell us about Jesus. And, and those, about three or four of them spoke up. And they said, oh, here we go. We're having Bible study. Oh, yeah, you believe that? Does that Bible say anything about Santa Claus? Later, I talked to him off the side. I said, you know, that was a really good verse. And I know where you were going. I said, but... And I shared with him a few ways of being more strategic about when to share things like that. You know, that guy could have been bit that day and never spoke up again. But because I was there, I'm able to say, here's something about how to handle that better in the future and praise God. And I gave him a passage where this says, uh, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. I told him I try to get with one or two, make sure I know my crowd, and then I'll go a little further. My point is this, guys. God is parsing everything of your day. And that guy who did that verse, you wouldn't know on the, out, on the surface that he's a believer, by the way, the guys talk about him certain things. He wrote me this past week in a text, and he says, I believe in Jesus with all my heart. I just need to get my life right with him. That was a text. And what I'm showing you here, the Bible says in the next verse, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. People who perish in the light of our awesome Savior, who sits upon a throne, is surrounded by four living creatures, the church one day will be in there with him, clothed in white raiment, crowns on their head, uh, given authority as well as opportunity, and blown away by it all time and a time and time again throughout eternity. That Savior wants everybody to come to repentance. And so when one generation is about ready to pass off the scene, he sees something in that generation. <laughs> What's the sand doing next to the ocean? Oh, there's something shiny. I think I can do something with that. Have you ever been there where you were like, this is like my wife, I'm going to close with this. I took my wife with me golfing one day. And 
and she she had a great score. She had two strokes, three kicks, and four throws, and she got it in. Okay, so she had her card going. But she learned something from me that I had learned from George. And that is, is that if you end up with more golf balls than you started with, you won. And so George will come out, I found me a ball. And he'll be throwing that baby up, and he'll be coming out of the woods, and he'll have that ball. Well, my wife learned that from me. Finally, she stumbles upon a part of the course where she's finding them everywhere. She's got her little shirt pulled up, and she's got these golf balls here, and she's, look at this, honey, look at this. I say, well, that's good. And, uh, man, we really are winners today. And ultimately, when we got home, I think it was Craig she told, she said, I got these balls, I got all these golf balls. It was a great day. And he said, Mom, that was the... Uh, That was the driving range. Those are the range balls over there. Isn't that funny? Beloved, what you have to understand is that God loves us despite ourselves. And He affiliates us with us despite ourselves. And I love the songwriter's words. He's going to come one day and He's going to say, This one's mine. Are you His? If you know you're his, you've got a lot to look forward to. Would you bow with me?